Green Revolution was driven by the introduction of things such as hybrid maize in Mexico, of semi-dwarf wheat and rice varieties in Latin America, parts of Latin America in Asia. And it led to significant increases in cereal crop production and productivity. This raised the incomes of smallholders. It enabled structural transformation through the creation of manufacturing and other relatively high wage jobs. And it was assisted by rural to urban migration and urban agglomeration economies. Standards of living throughout the Green Revolution countries improved dramatically for both rural and urban residents. So why can't we do that? Well, today's transformations will be different. They will be different for several reasons. First, the declining agricultural terms of trade. So real food prices are going to be about a third what they were, a quarter to a half what they were at the outset of the Green Revolution, which means the same productivity increase on the farm now generates about a third of the impact on gross farm revenues that it did at the beginning of the Green Revolution. The lengthening food supply chains. So at the start of the Green Revolution, farmers captured a large amount of the consumer value, the consumer dollar spent on food retail. Now in Africa, for example, farmers capture about 40% of the consumer retail value because of the lengthening of the food supply chains. In South Africa, over a four or five year period, the percent of bread value captured in the farm gate wheat price was about 13 to 18%, which means if you double the efficiency of farm wheat production, you're affecting about a 7 or 8% decline in the price of urban food. That's not a huge decline in urban food. That's not going to drive a, a, a wage that can all of a sudden feed people because of the improved price of urban food the way it did it during the Green Revolution. So we need to work on supply chains beyond the farm as well as in the farm. Demographics. In South Asia, there is a youth bulge. In Africa, there is an actual youth explosion. The population pyramids in Nigeria are just exploding out. There's no bulge, they're exploding out. And the projections in 2050 are that it will still explode out, but at a significantly higher number of young people, of youth. And so that has some significant implications about the ability of large urban areas to accommodate this youth population meaning we're going to need to do more in rural areas to keep them employed. And these youth bulges, youth explosions, may have uh, additional unintended side effects on people migrating to the urban areas in, in the sense, in the example of Addis Ababa, population of a, probably three to four million, about 20 million poor people in the countryside in Ethiopia, and already with a limited migration, you're seeing urban unrest as migrants settle on occupied agricultural land, they squat on, a, on the outsides of the city. And so what are you going to do if you're moving 20 million people into really the one large city in, in Ethiopia? It's going to be an issue. So we need to figure out solutions based on both urban and rural complementarities to provide these people with livelihoods in locations where they can grow and earn incomes. We're going to see this issue of rural populations in sub-Saharan Africa continuing as far as the projections go, which is 2050, even though urban populations eventually exceed rural populations in sub-Saharan Africa, the absolute number of the rural population is projected to continue to increase. This problem is not a three-year problem that will go away with a, when a youth bulge ages up. This is a problem for the foreseeable future. Deindustrialization is the phenomenon of declining manufacturing employment, often attributed to mechanization. All of the advanced economies for which data are available have experienced long-term declines in manufacturing employment. Even South Korea and Taiwan, where manufacturing output has expanded far more rapidly than in the United States, factories require fewer total hours of labor than was formerly the case. So the implication is that high-wage manufacturing growth is not going to drive African job creation and possibly not urban growth processes. Global climate change. We know a lot about adaptation and mitigation to global climate change. So adaptation requires more sustainable and resilient practices. Mitigation limits some agricultural opportunities, but also opens up new agricultural opportunities. 
And yes, this photo of the solar-powered irrigation pump is a Feed the Future photo from one of our projects. Global climate change also affects urban growth patterns, which will affect the ability of urban areas to create jobs and remain a destination for urban migrants. So what will drive today's agricultural transformation? On the farm, it is no longer about increasing cereal crop production so that farmers can feed their families and maybe have a little extra to sell. It's about commercializing smallholder agriculture as part of an integrated livelihood so that farmers can earn a reasonable return on the resources they invest in smallholder agriculture and can produce and purchase a healthy diet for their family. Increased farm productivity remains essential, but we're going to be looking more and more at value productivity here. How do you generate the greatest value for the smallholder relative to the amount of resources that the smallholder is able to put into that agriculture? A coordinated approach between staple crop productivity and value creating agriculture is thus necessary. Beyond the farm, it is about value chains and food systems that can provide access to affordable nutritious foods for both rural and urban consumers. So critical to this both urban and rural consumers, they have to achieve food and nutrition security through markets. And so you're going to have to have markets with the ability to deliver diverse, affordable, nutritious foods on a year-round basis. Hunger itself, we know, acts as a drag on growth. In Ethiopia, the estimates are that uh, hunger decreases gross domestic product by as much as 16.5 percent. So reducing hunger makes workers more productive, it increases economic growth, and it initiates a virtuous cycle. But we're, in today's economy, we have to reduce that hunger through the availability of nutritious foods and markets. Beyond the farm, it is about rural job creation. So smallholders and their children do not have to rely on farming as their sole source of income. They can have integrated livelihoods, and youth have the option to move off the farm into remunerative employment. It's about youth gaining human and financial capital through rural farm work and experience because this does two things. One, it greatly increases their ability to stay in a rural area and provide for the next generation. But second, if you have an impoverished youth with no physical capital, no financial capital, no human capital, and they move into a city, guess what? They are going to stay poor and evidence supports this. If you give them some job skills through rural employment, through some financial, capital, some human capital, they are far more likely to move into maybe a secondary city, earn some additional skills, get some gainful employment, and maybe eventually move into the primary city. It's about providing both food and other goods and services to support urban growth, including growth of rural small cities and towns, as part of an agriculturally-led inclusive growth process. So again, in the Green Revolution, we provided mostly low-wage foods, some investment money, um, that allows the urban manufacturers to invest and sell product to rural areas. We're going to have to provide even more linkages to urban areas in this new system. So these are generating clean power, pollution remediation for cities that cannot remediate their pollution, clean water provision. There's a whole host of opportunities that are starting to open up. Carbon sequestration to support urban growth processes, these are new and exciting opportunities that we can take advantage of as we move forward. With the multiple drivers of today's agricultural transformation, we can invest in those drivers that help feed the future countries achieve their visions out of what they want from their transformation. <laughs>